Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor here. You know, many people want to improve their sleep, but in order to improve your sleep, you have to know what to improve. It's kind of like a language. You need to learn the vocabulary before you can speak it fluently. So today, I'm gonna to show you exactly how sleep works, and you can put that knowledge to work for yourself later on. It turns out that there are two systems in the brain. One is called your sleep drive, the other is called your sleep rhythm. Your drive is a lot like hunger. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I eat something and that hunger begins to dissipate. The same holds true with sleep. When a cell eats a piece of glucose, something comes out the back end. One of those things is called adenosine. Adenosine works its way through your system and goes to a very specific receptor area in your brain. As adenosine accumulates, you get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. That's what makes you fall asleep. That's only one part of the system though. Part two is called your sleep rhythm, also known as your circadian rhythm. This is also a lot like hunger. So you ever notice how you're hungry, like breakfast time, around lunch time, and around dinner time? That is your circadian rhythm for hunger. You have one for sleep as well. Most people, at least here in North America, have a tendency to want to go to bed somewhere between 9.30 and probably 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. That's sort of their circadian rhythm for sleep. So what's interesting is if your drive is high, and your circadian rhythm is high, you sleep. But if either one of these is off, that's when you can have a sleep disorder. So you might be saying to yourself, well, Michael, how, how can one of these be off? Well, let's think about it. Now, there is a situation where you have more drive than you have rhythm. What could that possibly be? Think about it like this. Let's say that you went out with some friends and you played volleyball or golf or you had a big activity. You're pretty physically tired, probably more tired than you usually are. And what do you decide to do? get in bed a little early. So normally your bedtime's 11, but you're so dog tired, you figure I'm gonna get in bed at 9.30, get some extra great sleep. One of two things usually happens. Either you fall asleep for about 30 minutes, then wake up and you're up for the rest of the night, or you lie there physically exhausted, high sleep drive, but because you're in bed so early, your rhythm is off. And so what do you do? Stare at the ceiling. The opposite can also be true. Let's say you were so tired, you took a nap at five o'clock in the afternoon from five to let's say 5.30. Now it's 11, 11.30 at night, you're not able to fall asleep. Now it's 12 o'clock at night, you're still not able to fall asleep. You've got lots of circadian rhythm telling you to sleep, but your drive is low because you napped earlier in the day. So once again, what you're really looking for is a balance. You want drive and rhythm to basically work with each other. Now, there's more to the study than just these two systems. It turns out that we have these things called sleep stages, and we also have these things called sleep cycles. Here, you're gonna see what's called a hypnogram. So this is what we use in sleep medicine to describe the entire evening. Let me break this down for you. So orange represents wake, and so you can see we go from wake into what's called light sleep, that's in the gray here, that is stages one and two sleep. Don't worry, I'm gonna to explain to you what each one of those stages do in just a moment. Then we go into deep sleep, which is stages three and four, represented by dark blue. Then we go back into light sleep, and then go on into REM sleep, which is represented by the kind of baby blue color at the top. Now that in and of itself is what we call a sleep cycle. Sleep cycles usually go from one REM period to the next REM period. They average somewhere between 80 and 120 minutes, but for a good rule, I would always say a 90 minute sleep cycle makes a lot of sense. So that little dance maneuver that we see here, you have to actually go in that order. Couple of other things I wanna show you about this that's pretty interesting. Number one, you're gonna notice that deep sleep is front loaded the first third of the night. We seem to have the most amount of deep sleep. Then you're also gonna notice is REM sleep has a tendency to be across the middle of the night and much more towards the latter third of the night where you also will see less deep sleep. I'm gonna to explain to you why that happens in just a second. The amounts are things that people like to try to understand because a lot of people use a tracker. So for stage one, you should have somewhere between one and 2% of that given across the entire night. It's really a transitional stage. Stage two should make up somewhere between 45 and 50%. Stages three and four, deep sleep is roughly 25% and REM sleep is roughly 25%. Let's break it down one step further to know what each one of these stages actually does. So stage one, which again represents eh, one to 2%, this is the transition between wakefulness and sleep. This is where your muscles begin to relax, your breathing slows down, and your brain waves start to slow down. Your eyes begin to slowly roll back and forth. And if you wake up during this stage, by the way, you'll say that you weren't even asleep. It usually lasts only maybe 
five to 10 minutes. Stage two, which really represents the bulk of the night, this might feel like you're falling to sleep, right? That kind of beginning stage of sleep. And this is where your brain produces these rhythmic brain waves called sleep spindles. Also, your core body temperature begins to drop, your heart rate slows, and this really does make up most of your sleep. Now, to be fair, I don't pay a tremendous amount of attention to stages one and two. Where I really like to focus in is stages three and four and REM sleep. Stages three and four, which makes up again, 23 to 25% of the night, this is the wake up and feel great sleep. This is your physical restoration. Here, your blood pressure drops, respiration slows, and something called growth hormone is emitted. So the way I think about growth hormone is kind of like if you have a car and it's got some scratches and some dinks and some dents on it and you bring it into the body shop and you get all that stuff buffed out, that's stage three and four sleep. Growth hormone actually helps with cellular repair. So anything that you might have done working out or even just walking around, that gets fixed during stages three and four. There's also something else that happens during stage three and four. It's called the glymphatic system. This is a fairly recent discovery within the last five to 10 years. But we now know it's kind of like a waste management system for the brain. During stages three and four, process comes in and scoops out these proteins that get left over in your brain. The two proteins that we're most concerned about are something called beta amyloid and something called tau. Both of these, when left in the brain, they encircle your nerves and they begin to strangle your nerves. We actually call that Alzheimer's in, in, the, in the medical field. And so the more deep sleep you get to pull those proteins out, the better off you're going to be if you're looking at some of those diseases of cognitive decline. Now, REM sleep has got its own interesting aspects to it. This is the mentally restorative sleep. So what we've discovered now is REM sleep is when we're moving information from our short-term memory to our long-term memory, kind of creating like an organizational substructure inside your head, kind of like a filing cabinet. So you get data in all day long in your eyes and your ears, your nose, your mouth. You don't want to keep it all, but some of it you want to keep to be able to pull from, to you know, make decisions, to do different things, have knowledge, stuff like that. So your, your brain has to kind of suss that out and then move it over into sort of hard storage, if you will. Now, a couple of other things happen during REM sleep, which is pretty interesting. One of them is dreaming. So dreaming is a very interesting situation, something that I've personally got a lot of interest in lately. And what we're starting to discover now is dreams are what I call emotional metabolism. One of the things that happens during the dream besides memory consolidation is you work through your emotions. A lot of the imagery in the dream is imaginative. Between five and 15% of what goes on in a dream is factual and the rest is our imagination trying to process the emotions that are coming with the particular scenario that's playing in our head. So one of the things that our body does to us is it paralyzes us so that we don't act out our dreams. Believe it or not, there is a disorder in sleep called REM behavior disorder. I'm going to digress for a second and tell you a story about a patient who's got REM behavior disorder with this para paralysis doesn't occur. I started uh, my practice in Decatur, Georgia, DeKalb Medical Center right near Emory. And what was fun about that was I got a whole host of different types of patients. And the area of the country that I live in has a fairly large hunting community. I'm from Sandy Springs, Georgia. And if you're a hunter, you know that if you shoot a doe and you don't kill it, you either have to slit its throat or crack its neck. It's the most humane thing to do. So this gentleman came in with his uh, wife. He and she began to tell me the story of him waking up about ready to crack her neck. So he had actually come around the side of the bed in a dream wrapped his arms around her head and was literally about to snap her neck um, when she's screaming like, stop, stop, stop. So question number one, did he kill her? Everybody always wants to know if he killed her. The good news is he did not kill her. No lives have been spared for me to tell you this story. Question number two that I get all the time, are they still married? I'm gonna be honest with you, she's a very patient woman and we were able to find a medication called clonopin, which is the medication that is used for REM behavior disorder to silence this activity altogether. But I use it as an example because one of the things that was fascinating about this case in particular is REM behavior disorder turns out in 35% of the cases to be a precursor for Parkinson's syndrome. In this gentleman, it turned out to be the case and we were able to get him to neurology 
almost 10 years in advance of any Parkinsonian-like symptomatology. So when you start to see somebody doing crazy, funky things in their sleep, they could be sleepwalking, but they could have REM behavior disorder where they're actually acting out their dreams, and that could be a much bigger thing to be thinking about. Remember that most dreaming and REM sleep occurs in the last third of the night, and your body should have roughly 25% of that. Okay, so what do I do with all of this information now? So one of the things you can do as a general guideline is figure out your bedtime. So we know on average that a person has five sleep cycles, and we know that the average sleep cycle is roughly 90 minutes. So what I have people do, five times 90 is, anybody, anybody? 450 divided by 60 is seven and a half hours. Those were minutes, right? Five times 90 cycles is 450 minutes divided by 60 is seven and a half hours. So now take a socially determined wake up time. What time do you have to get up for work or for the kids to go to school? Let's say it's 6.30. Subtract seven and a half hours and guess what? Now you have a new bedtime, which would be 11 p.m. Most people have a tendency to get in bed too early and this can actually be a real problem because their sleep drive isn't high enough. Remember sleep drive from the beginning of the lecture and then they're not able to fall asleep, they get frustrated, then they increase their anxiety and then the night is pretty much done. So going to bed later and learning this very simple calculation can be extremely helpful. I will tell you if you wanna get even more precise in this bedtime calculation, one of the things that you can do is learn what your chronotype is. If you head on over to sleepdoctor.com, you can take the sleep quiz where you can learn about your sleep habits and learn what your chronotype is, and this will give you the exact wake up time and the exact amount of hours that you should be sleeping. Let's be honest here. When you get bad sleep, does it have any real effect on your body? You bet it does. I can show you studies where poor sleep leads to high blood pressure, heart disease, decreased immune function. I can show you how bad sleep leads to diabetes, stroke, even increased pain. Interesting study was done out of the University of Chicago where they were doing what's called the cold presser test. So they would take college kids and they would have a, a big bucket of ice water and they would measure the temperature of the water. Then they'd have to take off their socks and shoes and be wearing shorts. And then they would put their feet into the water and it was so, so cold and really painful, but it doesn't do any uh, physical damage to the tissue. And then the scientists would time them to see how long could they take it. Then they had them stay up all night long and do the exact same test, same water, same temperature. Guess what? They could only handle it for 50% of the time. So getting less sleep made the pain hurt twice as much. So if you're a person with fibromyalgia, if you're a person with low back pain and you're not getting the sleep you need, your pain actually feels worse than you thought it did. Another area that's really interesting is weight gain. I know there's a lot of people out there who are you know, thinking about losing weight and trying to get back in better shape. In my second book, The Sleep Doctor's Diet, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep, you'll learn that actually you can't lose weight without having a good night's sleep. There are so many different things that will occur to you in terms of your hormones in your body. Let me give you a few examples. When you become sleep deprived, your metabolism slows down and your cortisol raises, which means your appetite raises in the morning. Two other hormones get affected by sleep deprivation. One is something called ghrelin, which increases hunger. And then one is called leptin, which lowers feelings of fullness. Then you top it all off. And when you're sleep deprived, you crave high fat, high caloric food to lower that cortisol. If that's not a recipe for weight gain, I don't know what is. But the good news here is that good sleep reverses almost all of this stuff. Good sleep has been shown to lower blood pressure, lower heart disease, increase immune function, decrease pain, increase reaction time. I mean, quite honestly, everything you do, you do better with a good night's sleep. What I thought I would do now is talk to everybody about some of the natural vitamins and minerals that you can be taking during the daytime that can show a benefit to your sleep. You may not even know this, but there are several different things out there that can be super duper beneficial for you, and most of which you can get from a healthy diet. I gotta talk about the first set of vitamins, the B vitamins. To be fair, Bs really do have a tendency to run sleep. B3 in particular increases the effectiveness of something called tryptophan, and it lengthens your REM sleep. Tryptophan is something that you can actually make in your body. 
B6 is required for serotonin production, which is that calming hormone that helps you slow down. And B12 helps actually sustain normal sleep patterns. Foods high in the B vitamins might include things like whole grains, cereal, nuts, broccoli, potatoes, things of that nature. So do yourself a favor and you wanna get your Bs. But you also wanna be careful if you're in the supplement world. I have personally found that if I take my B vitamins at night, they give me too much energy. And so I have to use a B vitamin supplement in the morning time. Tryptophan is something that's kind of interesting. It's a precursor to melatonin in the brain. There are plenty of foods that are high in tryptophan, whole grains, dairy, meat, eggs, broccoli, asparagus, things like that. And a lot of people say to, my, say to me, oh, Dr. Bruce, turkey, that's loaded with tryptophan. That's something that I should be eating. Honestly, you'd have to eat like a 46 pound turkey in order to get enough tryptophan to actually make it worth your while. And tryptophan doesn't work particularly well in the presence of protein. So it's probably not the thing to do. But being able to include whole grains, dairy, and broccoli, asparagus, high fiber vegetables in your diet is definitely going to be helpful. Another vitamin that I'm a big fan of, vitamin D. So for folks out there who don't know this, vitamin D actually functions as a hormone. It sends signals all over your body, telling your body to do all kinds of things. But for our purposes, you have to understand vitamin D is a circadian pacemaker. It actually keeps your body's clock running and functioning appropriately. It's actually produced by your body in the presence of sunlight, and it keeps your biological clocks kind of going on time. Now, there are a lot of ways to get vitamin D, but the best is obviously sunshine. If you can get out in the sunshine for 15 minutes a day, just 15 minutes, that's enough time for your body to actually start to produce vitamin D. If you live in a part of the country where there's not a whole lot of sunshine, there's nothing wrong with the vitamin D supplementation or making sure that you eat fatty fish, certain mushrooms, egg yolks, things of that nature. Another mineral now that's an important one for sleep turns out to be calcium. Calcium helps regulate uh, blood pressure and as well as it's a natural relaxer. So for folks who are deficient in calcium, that can be a problem. For you women out there who may have osteoporosis or have low calcium in your bones, this can actually be an issue for you. Foods that are high in calcium include uh, products like broccoli, collards, uh, kale, almonds, sunflower seeds, things like that, even dairy. Now, the biggie that everybody always wants to talk about is magnesium. And the truth of the matter is, is there's some data to show that magnesium is definitely helpful for sleep. But more importantly, a magnesium deficiency can cause insomnia. So one of the things we really want to avoid is any magnesium deficiencies. And to be fair, there's a lot of people out there with magnesium deficiencies. It turns out that you have to eat your magnesium. Your body doesn't produce it. And our soil has been so over-tilled over the course of time that magnesium isn't coming up through the root stalks of our, our root vegetables and really getting to us. So I would have to tell you that many people out there really do need to have some level of supplementation. Foods high in magnesium are things like bananas, dark leafy greens, avocados, dark chocolate, beans, nuts, things like that. But please, 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 if you're going to supplement with magnesium, understand something. There are 10 different kinds of magnesium. Be careful, don't overdo it on the magnesium. A lot of people, if they have too much magnesium, that can cause loose stools or diarrhea, and that can make stuff very, very unpleasant. So slow and go is the way to do it for magnesium. And to be fair, if you really wanna have a super duper natural way to get your magnesium, my favorite is to use my recipe for what I call banana tea. It actually doesn't have any tea in it, and all you need is a banana and some water and a stove. So what you do is you take one whole banana, wash off the outside, cut off the tip and the stem, cut it in half, leave the peel on and the fruit in it. All I've asked you to do so far is wash off a banana and cut off the top and the bottom. The peel of the banana has three times the amount of magnesium as the fruit itself. So take those and drop them with the peel on in the water. Boil it for about three to five minutes or until the banana turns brown and then drink the water. Maybe a cup, cup and a half. Number one, as my daughter likes to say, dad, it's very banana-y. So you really have to like bananas. But as long as you like bananas, it's loaded with magnesium. It's 100% natural. It does not interact with any medication out there, um, does not interact with any other supplements. I will tell you though, if you are diabetic or pre-diabetic, this has probably got too high of a glycemic index, so talk with your doctor. This is Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor, wishing you sweet dreams.